Augustine, the fifth commandment, and the sin of scandal today on The Simple Truth. I'm Jim Havens. It is Thursday Catechesis, where we strive to faithfully hand on the authoritative, essential, and fundamental contents of Catholic doctrine in faith and morals for ongoing formation and ongoing conversion with our co-host every Thursday, Father Jeff Fashing. He's a priest of 26 years, known for his unwavering preaching of authentic Orthodox Catholicism. Support his good work by going to givesendgo.com slash veritas. We consecrate everything to the sacred heart of Jesus through the immaculate heart of Mary and the pure, strong heart of St. Joseph. Father Fashing, always great to have you with us. How are you today, and will you lead us in an opening prayer? Yeah, thank you, Jim. Yes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Mark, the evangelist, pray for us. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. All right. So the topic today, life everlasting, the fifth commandment, the sin of scandal. This is all recommended to us from the Roman Catechism, the Catechism of the Council of Trent. The sermon program in the front uh, says third Sunday after Easter. That's the Sunday we're coming out of that this is uh, the recommendation what to preach on. And remember that this uh, this catechism, this universal catechism of the church, was edited under St. Charles Borromeo, published by the decree of Pope St. Pius V, 1566. And um, just a, a fantastic resource, um, even uh, even the language a bit antiquated in places, and sometimes uh, you might have to look up a word or two, but still there, there's a way that the faith is being presented here. Um, in, in the in the counter revolution um, of the, uh, the the revolution, uh, oftentimes called the Reformation, the Protestant Revolution, uh, of which this is a response to the the, the Council of Trent, and then the Catechism of the Council of Trent, proclaiming the the faith of the essential contents of the Catholic faith um, in faith and morals uh, for the people of that time, but still. Uh, it holds true for the people of our time as well, and there's a way that it's fleshed out here where you're going to get certain nuances, certain emphasis that uh, is still very, very helpful uh, for us today to be going through from time to time. So we're doing that here on the Thursday shows with Father Fashing, and uh, got a great topic today, Life Everlasting. Uh, this, is, this is outstanding to hop into that. And then the Fifth Commandment, there's more there uh, than what you might think, and then a little bit on the sin of scandal as well. Father, where would you like to begin? Well, when we speak of life everlasting, of course, it calls to mind the fact, or it should, that we are people in this world, but not of it. And St. John Vianney would say that the eyes of the world see no farther than this earth, this present place, but the eyes of the Christian see deep into eternity. So we're focusing on our true homeland. And in the catechism, there's this section on the beatific vision speaking about the light of glory, and if I may, I'll just read that. For those who enjoy God while they retain their own nature, assume a certain admirable and almost divine form, so as to seem gods rather than men. Why this transformation takes place becomes at once intelligible if we only reflect that a thing is known either from its essence or from its image and appearance. Consequently, as nothing so resembles God as to afford by its resemblance a perfect knowledge of him, it follows that no creature can behold his divine nature and essence unless this same divine essence has joined itself to us. And this St. Paul means when he says, we now see through a glass in a dark mirror, but then face to face. The words, in a dark manner, St. Augustine understands the mean that we see him in a resemblance calculated to convey to us some notion of the deity. So there's this absolute reference to the beatific vision. And I'll just go on. The Catechism says, with respect to the beatific vision, for the blessed all we see God present and by his greatest and most exalted of gifts being made partakers of the divine nature. And the Catechism goes on to speak about baptism, which we'll come to uh, after a little later in the show, and the fruits and effects of baptism. But the Catechism reads, they enjoy true and solid happiness. Our belief in this happiness should be joined with an assured hope that we too 
shall one day through the divine goodness attain it. This is the Father's this the fathers declared in their creed, which says, I expect the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. We pray it every Sunday. So again, calling to mind this notion that we were born for God. We were born to be with him. He created us to share in his glory. And so when we speak about glory, and this is really what I want to get into, because it's what motivates me as a priest, and it should motivate all of us as Christians and soldiers of Christ that there are different degrees of glory in heaven. What do we mean by glory? Just like, you know, God created the world in a hierarchical fashion. He set up the church in a hierarchical fashion. There's um, a gradation in prayer. In other words, there are higher things we have to pray for first, and the list goes on. Well, the same is true for glory in heaven because different saints enjoy different degrees of glory based on what they did in this life. So the Catechism alludes to this reality of faith and works. And the Protestants believe that we simply have to believe in God and it's enough. But St. James is very clear that we have to put our faith into practice. So what we do is how we'll be judged, our charity, our love. And speaking of glory, the Catechism says, for the blessed shall enjoy glory. Not only that glory which we have already shown to constitute essential happiness or to be its inseparable accompaniment, but also that glory which consists in the clear and distinct knowledge which each of the blessed shall have of the singular and exalted dignity of his companions in glory. So it reminds us that God has called mankind to... Um, in God's gracious goodness to this destiny that surpasses our natural powers. So again, we were created for heaven. We were created for eternity. God has elevated our nature by endowing it with this supernatural life, Jim. And so this is a sharing, as the Catechism says, in his divine life. God gives us grace as a pure gift, but we have to receive it and cooperate with it in order to grow in union with him. And in Catholic tradition, this free cooperation with grace that permits us to grow in divine life is called merit. And so we want to store up merit for ourselves in heaven. The Blessed Virgin Mary, for example, is the best example. She stored up infinite merit because of her sinlessness and her perfection. Okay, so merit may be defined as a good work freely done that's worthy of this promised reward. It may be defined as the right to a promised reward because of a good work done. And again, this is a doctrine rejected by the Protest Protestants, but when God in his mercy freely justifies the sinner and gives the life of grace with this gift, he gives us that capacity to cooperate with the grace and to grow in the life of grace. And that flows from our baptism. One of the fruits of the baptism is receiving this grace that we lose through original sin. But that capacity is what's meant by merit. So just a simple example, if somebody does a favor for you, you bring him to your home perhaps, and you pay him to do a task or something around the house, okay, that is likened to what merit is. He gets a reward for the labor done. And again, even though merit isn't a biblical term, Okay, like many other terms that are realities that aren't found in the Bible. And again, this is another one of those stumbling blocks of the Protestant. You'll constantly hear them say, well, where is it in the Bible? There are many, there are many realities that are truths that are not necessarily mentioned in the Bible. Okay, but it's been traditionally merit has used to express these complex of ideals deals that are found in the Bible. Okay, so think about Holy Trinity or the word Bible itself, Holy Eucharist, Holy Orders, Ordination. They're not found in the Bible, but they express realities taught in the Bible. And the reality of this merit is expressed in the Bible under these images like St. Paul talks about in our Lord too. What? Reward, repayment, wages, prize crown, which God has given as a just judge to those who do good works. And so 
again, this notion of glory is really what should motivate us. And I know it motivated every single saint in a humble and godlike way, you know, because they knew what really mattered and they worked for it on this earth, Jim. So it's this notion of this is the veil of tears. This is the time to work. This is the time to labor. And then, Jim, we'll enjoy that reward, God willing, in heaven. And I want to keep uh, following up on this mm-hmm. as we go. Yeah, I think it's, um, yeah, the, the way you lay it out, it, it makes a lot of sense why also um, it's uh, the Catechism of the Council of Trent is coupling this with a proclamation on, um, on expounding on the fifth commandment, which the positive side of the fifth commandment, we know the fifth commandment, thou shall not kill, um, specifically thou shall not murder once we really unpack it. But um, it, the positive side is, is really all about the virtue of charity and how we're being called to love God, really love our neighbor out of love of God. And um, we know that Jesus said this over and over, if you love me, keep the commandments. And that ought to be our motivation our love of God. Um, And yet he wants to reward us when we do good. uh, Our father wants to reward us for those loving actions that we take. There are good consequences. And I don't know how anybody can deny it being in the Bible. Just look at what Jesus says in the judgment of nations, Matthew 25, when he says, whatever you do to the least of these, you do it unto me. Whatever you don't do, you don't do it unto me. And you will be judged accordingly. He makes that very, very clear. We're going to be right back. Stay tuned. The Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network presents Saints and Seasons. On April 25th, we celebrate the feast of St. Mark, Evangelist. Mark was born a Jew of the priestly tribe of Levi and Aaron, according to St. Bede the Venerable. He may have also been known as John or John Mark, and some theorize that Mark was the young man who fled naked from the garden when our Lord was arrested. Mark was a close disciple of St. Peter and served as the first Pope's interpreter. He composed his gospel at the request of the Roman faithful under the direct aid, influence, and approval of his master, Peter. Mark went on to become the founding bishop of the city of Alexandria and thus the father of the church in Africa. In the year of our Lord, 68, he was apprehended by angry pagans in Alexandria. They dragged him through the streets for an entire day, tearing his body nearly to pieces before throwing him into prison where he was consoled by heavenly visions. Mark was dragged through the streets again the next day until he finally expired. His relics now rest under the high altar in the great St. Mark's Basilica in Venice. Mark's symbol as an evangelist is the lion. His feast is now closely associated with the greater litanies and rogation procession that were assigned to this date even before St. Mark's feast was fixed to it. Also celebrated on this day are the cobbler St. Anianus, disciple and successor of St. Mark, St. Stephen of Antioch, St. Peter de Betancourt, and many other martyrs, confessors, and holy virgins. For more about the saints and seasons of the Catholic Church, visit thestationofthecross.com forward slash saints and seasons. Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with Father Jeff Fashing going over the Catechism of the Council of Trent today on the topic of life everlasting, the fifth commandment, and the sin of scandal. Uh, Before we get back to Father, I just want to mention this with regard to the beatific vision that Father was talking about in that first segment. Um, It says here in the Catechism of the Council of Trent regarding uh, this, it says that um, beatitude consists of two things. We shall behold God such as he is in his own nature and substance. And it goes through talking about this, that um, this life everlasting, um, meaning it never ends and we possess God. We have him and forever and he can never be taken away from us. It, It is confirmed. We are with him for all eternity. How glorious that must be. Um, And so we actually are able to behold him as he is in his own nature and substance. And we ourselves shall become, as it were, gods with a lower G, gods. This is what it says in in the Council uh, of Trent Catechism here. And uh, that ought to kind of make us think for a second, well, wait a minute here. That seems seems like a, a pretty exalted thing to say we become, as it were, gods. Again, lowercase g, not we're becoming God, not some sort of a weird new age thing, not at all. It even clarifies in the next line here where it says, and Father read this 
in the last segment, for those who enjoy God while they retain their own nature, assume a certain admirable and almost divine form so as to seem gods, lowercase g, rather than men. We don't actually become God or become gods, um, but it seems like it in the sense that what it's trying to say here is that we retain our own human nature, um, but we assume this certain admirable, almost divine form um, because we are so filled with him, filled with his life um, and for all eternity. So we don't really know what this is like, the fullness of human life, to be fully alive in the life of God. And um, we know that this entails a glorified body. There's a lot to this that is incredible. And um, what it does say here too as well is that um, with these truths, they're so divine that they cannot be expressed in any words or comprehended by us in thought, uh, certainly not fully. It says, though, we may, however, trace some resemblance of this happiness in sensible objects. Then it gives us this example to help us uh, to ponder this. It says, iron, when acted on by fire, becomes inflamed, and while it is substantially the same, seems changed into fire a different substance. So likewise, the blessed who are admitted into the glory of heaven and burn with a love of God are so affected that without ceasing to be what they are, they may be said with truth to differ more from those still on earth than red hot iron differs from itself when cold. So that iron still the same thing when it's cold or when it's red hot uh, in iron. It seems like almost a different thing. It's so different, but it is the same thing. Um, so too for us when we are on earth versus filled with the glory of heaven and for all eternity, um, it, we're still human, uh, but but fully so in the glory of God. It's going to be very, very different. Um, and again, Jesus told us that uh, eye is not seen, ear is not heard. Uh, our minds cannot even conceive of what uh, God has planned for us. So again, we need to be faithful. We need to receive his love, love him back, strive to live that life of grace and goodness, of love to of him and our neighbor that he calls us to. And in the end, we know this great reward, our heavenly homeland for all eternity, filled with God, with him, able to see him and be with him as he truly is. And, and we can't even imagine it, uh, But but I hope, uh, just reflecting on this a little bit and the way the Council of Trent, the Catechism of the Council of Trent puts it forth, um, that it inspires us, inspires our hearts to, to be filled with, with more motivation to live by God's grace, that virtue of hope to which we're called to, where we keep that before our eyes, our heavenly homeland, understanding ourselves here in a pilgrimage on earth, going towards heaven, and then to really act accordingly. Father, please continue on. Yes, Jim, you're talking about the realization of what we were born for that we were talking about in the first segment of the show. So in order to enjoy that face-to-face -face with God, we are in a very real sense become gods with a small g in, in that we have to share in his divine nature in order to even be in his presence. You know, as it stands now, we would die in our fallen human nature if we stood before the glory and majesty of God. So there's a change that has to take place. So now we're talking about how it is that we get to that state while we're on this pilgrim earth. And the catechism alludes to this in this section, actually. The surest way is within the bosom of the Catholic Church. Okay, that's why Christ instituted the Catholic Church and the sacraments therein, especially the Eucharist and penance, as this sole means of salvation, as the, the best way of getting to that beatific vision. So they change us, you know, the Holy Sacrament of the Eucharist, which is God himself, transforms us and prepares us for what we're talking about, this glory. Okay, so we're speaking about glory and getting there. And this literally, Jim, for all of our listeners, should give us a reason to live. And I, I say that completely seriously. I'm not joking. This is the reason to live because there's this notion of glory and reward that's very explicit in the New Testament. For example, in Matthew 5, verse 11, our Lord himself speaks of the what? Reward that will be given to us for our good works. He says to those who suffer persecution, for example, be glad and rejoice for your reward is great in heaven. He says in chapter 6 of Matthew, verse 11, 
He says, when you give alms, do it in secret, and your father who sees in secret will repay you. Matthew 6, verse 6, rather. And he says in verse 18, when you fast, do not appear to be fasting, and your father who sees what is hidden will repay you. And it goes on and on. He urges his disciples not to store up earthly treasure, but instead to store up treasure in heaven in Matthew 6, 20. And remember when Peter asked Jesus what the disciples could expect, for having given, giving up all things to follow him, Jesus says in Matthew 19, he says, everyone who has given up home, brothers or sisters, father or mother, wife or children, or property for my sake, will receive many times as much and inherit everlasting life. And so it's literally, Jim, a reason to live. I mean, this notion of glory and the reward that we'll get for our good works. And we know that St. Paul, when he proclaimed that men are saved by what? Faith and not by works of the law. He at the same time, and this is very important because the Protestants don't get this. St. Paul teaches that God will reward every person according to his works and that each one will reap only what he sows. In his letter to the Romans, St. Paul says, on that day, he will repay every man for what he has done. Eternal life to those who strive for glory honor and immortality by patiently doing what's right, wrath and fury to those who selfishly disobey the truth and obey wickedness. There will be glory and honor and peace for everyone who has done good. He says that in Romans 6, verses 2 to 10. And so again, there's an extensive reality in the New Testament by St. Paul. He encourages those who labor for the Lord by assuring them them in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 8, that everyone will receive his wages in proportion to his toil. In Colossians 3, he says, whatever you do, work at it with your whole being. Do it for the Lord rather than for men, since you know full well you will receive an inheritance from him as your reward. So it's it's very clear. And, you know, the scriptures, we rely so much on them for this show. And we know that that's one of the way that Christ, one of the ways that Christ, Jim, makes himself present to us. Like, He's present in many ways. He's present, for example, when the scriptures are read. He's present when people gather together in his name. He's present in all the sacraments, but he's especially present in the Eucharist. But the scripture is a reality that we cannot ignore. But also with that, as the Catholic doctrine teaches, is tradition. They two go hand in hand. We don't separate the two. So... It's something very important for us now to realize that what we do or don't do, we talk about this a lot, actually has ramifications. And like you said earlier, Jim, when we started this second segment, God wants to reward us. Um, He pays attention to absolutely everything, and he will reward us. We may not see it in this life, but what matters, Jim, as you so beautifully alluded to, was this reality of eternal and this glory that we'll share with him face to face. That's what we're getting at. Mm -hmm. And there's so much here, but this is, this is such a great reality. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I love this little, uh, this tiny little section that packs it all in, distills it down. It just says right at the end here, how to arrive at the enjoyment of this happiness. And it says the pastor therefore should not only encourage the faithful to seek this happiness, but should frequently remind them that the sure way of obtaining it is to possess the virtues of faith and charity to persevere in prayer and to use this uh, and the use of the sacraments and to discharge all the duties of kindness towards their neighbor. Um, and then it points us over to the, the, the sacrament of baptism and just tells us very quickly here that there are uh, just wants to tell us there are many advantages, but this one advantage from baptism, the last advantage to which all the other advantages seem to be referred is that baptism opens to us the portals of heaven, which sin had closed against us. Thanks be to God for the sacrament of baptism. Father, please continue. Yeah, and among other things, we literally receive the divine indwelling along with that, Jim. So God dwells within us, God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And so we have this certain power. I I try to remind people about this as much as I can. People know it, but sometimes they forget that we have all power over every evil when we're united in grace to Jesus Christ, especially by virtue of our baptism. It's such a wonderful sacrament, as if all the sacraments aren't wonderful, but baptism transforms us. It literally changes us in our lives forever. So 
There's a certain power, which is the power of God that dwells in us, that gives us strength and courage. These things are all available to us, but we have to tap into them. Okay, they lie dormant in so many people, but Christ came to light a fire on the earth. And the Catechism of the Council of Trent is great for pastors. It should help light a fire under them as to what they are to convey to their followers. And we keep talking about this glory and this motivation and this reward. So remember again, St. Paul, there's other texts even where he writes, you know, he uses this notion of uh, athleticism, like running the race to win the prize. So he says in Corinthians, for example, he says, you know that while all the runners in the stadium take part in the race, the award goes to one man in that case runs so as to win. Athletes die themselves, all sorts of things. They do this to win a crown that leaves, that, that fades and withers, but we a crown that's imperishable. So St. Paul says in Philippians 3.14, I don't run like a man who loses sight of the finish line. What I do is discipline my own body and master it. So remember the theology of St. Paul. Again, this is key. That we are justified by faith and saved by grace, not by works. It's only works that proceed from faith and love that bring an eternal reward. And this only because God, by His grace, has made such good works possible and because He has graciously promised to reward them, Jim. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Let us, let us remember again what our Lord said, that judgment of nations, Matthew 25, whatever you do to the least of these, you do it unto me. Whatever you don't do, you don't do it unto me. And then it says this in the Catechism of the Council of Trent, looking with joyful countenance on the just standing on his right. What this, what this judgment will be like for the just. Christ our Redeemer will pronounce sentence on them with the greatest benignity, the greatest goodness in these words. Come ye blessed of my Father, possess the kingdom prepared for you from the beginning of the world. That nothing can be conceived more delightful to the ear than these words. We shall understand if we only compare them with the condemnation of the wicked and then it goes on from there let us uh continue Go, we'll be right back stay tuned welcome back to the simple truth jim havens here with father jeff fashion talking about life everlasting the fifth commandment the sin of scandal today and uh, unpacking this as we go. If you want to get a call in, any question or comment on any of this, one 511 5483 That's 1-877-511-5483. Uh, just to wrap up that meditation right from the uh, end of that last segment uh, that the uh, Catechism of the Council of Trent wants us to uh, to take a, 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 some time to think about, which is the sentence of the just at that judgment of nations, those who love Jesus in the least of these. And now they're hearing these words of this, uh, of this sentence um, of glory. Um, Come ye blessed of my father, possess the kingdom prepared for you from the beginning of the world. Matthew 25, 34. Uh, again, it says here, nothing can be conceived more delightful to the ear than these words. And we shall understand them if we, compare them to the condemnation of the wicked. We don't want to hear those words depart from me, right? Um, and then it says to call to mind that by them, by these words, the just are invited from labor to rest, from the veil of tears to supreme joy, from misery to eternal happiness, the reward of their works of charity. So there it is. And I don't know how anybody, again, can deny when you read the words of our Lord Jesus in Matthew 25 and the judgment of nations, what you, what you do to the least of these, you do it unto me. Uh, it's very clear here, the way it works. It, yes, it is a participation with God's grace, but participating with God's grace is that's something that we have to do by nature of our freedom. We have to, in faith, say yes and act according to that grace that God is pouring out for us. And when we do, when we are faithful, uh, there are rewards to it. And, um, and this is one of them. And our Lord is making it very, very clear. So, um, so faith and works. And um, I don't know how you can, can only have faith and not have works. I think, yeah, James is pretty clear in that one that um, it would be dead. It would, it would not be real faith if we aren't living it out and that it would be evident in our works. Father, please continue. People can just kind of gloss over certain scripture passages. We can't do that. We don't have the privilege of doing that. But just to hammer it home, Jim, and then maybe we can kind of move on. The Council of Trent's decree on justification states the following, quote, If anyone says that, 
by the good work the justified person performs through the grace of God and the merits of Jesus Christ, of whom he is a living member, the justified person does not truly merit an increase of grace, eternal life, and provided he dies in the state of grace, the attainment of this eternal life, as well as an increase of glory, anathema sit. In other words, it's a doctrine you have to believe in to be Catholic, or you're not really part of the church. So it is very clear. It's very explicit. And you mentioned this happiness that comes through baptism. The catechism speaks about the sacrament of baptism, as you alluded to, as we were talking about, but it says, how do we arrive at the enjoyment of this happiness that the catechism is talking about? It says the pastor, therefore, should not only encourage the faithful to seek this happiness, but should frequently remind them that the sure way of obtaining it is to possess the virtues of faith and charity. So, Jim, as you mentioned, just as there is this reward that we've been talking about, conversely, for neglecting these good works or perhaps doing not good works, we're also going to be condemned or face a certain reality that is punishment. So how do we attain this happiness? The Catechism says to persevere in prayer and the use of the sacraments and to discharge all the duties of kindness toward our neighbor. So our basic duty toward God is simple. It's twofold, to pray, to love, or to practice charity. So the Catechism says through the mercy of God, who has prepared that blessed glory for those who love him, and that love for God is made manifest, Jim, in our good works, and our love for neighbor, shall be one day fulfilled, the words of the prophet, my people shall sit in the beauty of peace and in the tabernacle of confidence and in wealthy rest. So it talks about the sacrament of baptism, a wonderful sacrament, but I kind of want to talk about the sacrament of all sacraments, the Holy Eucharist, Jim, because it's next to impossible. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to reach this eternal blessedness without the Eucharist. So I want to reiterate how we often talk about on the show that Christ didn't arbitrarily institute any of the sacraments, let alone the sacrament of the Eucharist, the most important one. And it's a command of his to receive it. Hey, this is how we get to heaven. So we have this notion of holy orders that the Protestants deny in the sacrament of the Eucharist court, of course, but the holy sacrifice of the mass is intrinsically of course, of an infinite value because of the infinite worth of Jesus Christ as the victim and the priest. So at the Mass, we're offering Christ to God. So that sacrifice has an infinite value in that sense. And so the holy sacrifice of the math, Mass, I think it's worth talking about, is it's an act of the Church by means of the priest. And the merit of the Mass is therefore founded upon what? The holiness of the Church. We can't gain merit without being holy. We can't get our rewards without being holy. We must be pleasing to God and in a state of grace. So since the holy sacrifice of the Mass is an act of the Church, the moral status, for example, of the priest, because Jim, we were talking about skin and, sin and scandal maybe later on in the show, the moral status of the priest, okay, we have to remember, does not increase or decrease the value of the Mass in this respect, thank God, right? The Church is made holy by Jesus Christ. The prayers and gestures of the Mass that the church offers at the hands of the priest are always viewed favorably by God. So the faithful can always rest assured that even if the priest or other of the faithful at a particular mass are not holy, they can still derive fruit from the mass based upon the holiness of the church. Now, obviously, we want holy priests. And this is one thing I'm going to give a talk on soon, is what you, the laity, are actually entitled to in your priests and pastors and bishops that you're not getting, that you're so in desperate of need of, and that is holy priests. Okay, and obviously it's not every last one, but there are so many out there that are falling short of who they're supposed to be as priests. So the holiness of the church consists what? In the sanctity of its members. We're all called to sanctify ourselves. This is really our reason for living, is our sanctification, Jim. So the church's holiness, therefore, has to depend upon the holiness of what? The reigning pope, bishops, and clergy throughout the world. And this is where our problem lies. So this is why in times of ecclesiastical decay, one could argue like now, or laxity of morals at the papal court, for example, and among the episcopate, the fruits of the mass might, under circum certain circumstances, be quite small. And that's why people... And I see this when I travel, and I don't travel extensively, but when I go to do a conference here and there, I hear this from people speaking about their pastors. 
okay? If the actual members of the church are not very holy, their lack of holiness has a direct impact on the efficacy of the Mass, Jim. Because the Mass is always offered up as a public prayer. There's really no such thing as a private Mass. It's always public. Christ is there. Countless angels are there. The Blessed Virgin Mary is there. It's offered on behalf of the church. So it's really always public, even when it's offered, quote unquote, privately by a priest. So if there's a scandal among the clergy and the bishops, which we might get into, or this general notion of, uh, of sin and scandal, the faithful suffer spiritually, and that's what's happening. You know, it's all over, unfortunately. But we have to actually be real about what's going on. <laughs> Since the first of the Mass, yeah, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I mean, it also um, connects to when I think about the the other topics for today that we're, we're going to get to a, a little bit, the fifth commandment, the sin of scandal, and it seems like it's teed up uh, perfectly for us. I wish it weren't, uh, but we saw this week uh, President Joe Biden, um, where he was at a pro-abortion rally, and as they're talking uh, about advancing uh, the ongoing daily mass murder of our littlest brothers and sisters, he does a sign of the cross um, in the middle of it, in support of it. Um, I mean, it, that, it doesn't get more scandalous than that. So we're talking about the fifth commandment, thou shall not kill, um, while we have this ongoing daily mass murder of the least of the least of these. And then uh, the sin of scandal, where the catechism here, it's pointing to the sin of scandal and basically just simply laying out that um, we are called to live up. Uh, to to what the faith calls us to, and the t the degree to which we don't do that is scandalous, and it it pushes others away from the faith. They look at us and say, "Well, if that's what Catholics are like, uh, I don't want any part of it. We ought to be a good representation of the faith that draws people into into the faith." And uh, Joe Biden, right now, you couldn't give a more upside down view of what the Catholic faith is than the way, than what he's saying and what he's doing and uh, perfectly encapsulated in that moment where he, um, he does the sign of the cross at that pro-abortion rally. Father, any thoughts on that? Yeah, Jim, he's just one example among many. Also, this notion of publicly being able to receive the Holy Eucharist, it's really an abomination. Um, the powers that be in the church allowing this to happen but I think it's a great point, this hypocrisy of, you know, we're so concerned about these outward killings that we see, but the helpless unborn, it goes ignored. So I think to your point, Jim, again, if there's a scandal among the clergy or the bishops or the government, the powers that be, what the faithful suffer spiritually. So we have to remember the fruits of the mass may also be applied to those who are not Catholics. So the same may be said for mankind as a whole. The Pope and bishops, or we could say government leaders, they have a grave responsibility for moral reform among the clergy and the laity, the bishops do. So the priest, because by the virtue of his priesthood, he offers the holy sacrifices of the Mass. That's his chief function by his very priesthood. He's also, therefore, able to merit something for those for whom he offers the Mass. Because of his priesthood, he can gain fruit for those for whom he prays. So in this sense, the sanctity of the priest actually does not affect the fruits coming from the Mass. But again, we want holy priests. We want holy public figures, but it just hasn't happened for so long, and we're at this point. It didn't happen overnight, Jim. I mean, you gave the best example because abortion is at the top of the list of scandalous behavior. It's, it's the most grievous. It's the one that we have to fight against the most as Catholics. You know, I don't have to tell you that, but it's by far the most important, okay? And again, you know, we were talking about, this all came about because we were talking about happiness and the sacraments, particularly baptism and the Holy Eucharist. But with respect to the Eucharist, this particular office that the priest holds ha does have some effect on the fruits of the Mass. In other words, for example, the office of the bishop is different, right, than the office of the priest, because the bishop possesses the fullness of the priesthood. He's a successor to the apostles. He's a successor to St. Peter. His merit flowing from his episcopacy should have greater merit than that of a priest. It should. But this isn't always the case. It's possible for a priest, of course, to be holier than a bishop and thus merit more fruits for the Mass. But as far as the office is concerned, 
it should be a reality that a mass offered by a bishop should be more efficacious than one offered by a priest. But again, obviously, that's not always true. So this is why, again, the, and it's analogous to your point, Jim, the holiness of the clergy has a direct impact on the life of the church. And we've just, over all these years, I think what we're seeing is just this settling for this priest is just that way, or he's not a very good homilist, or, you know, we're all going to sin. But when you talk about sin and scandal, Jim, we're talking about persistence in it. And this is what we're seeing. This is the problem. It's one thing to sin and then repent. But we're talking about scandalous behavior in the sense that it's becoming the norm. And there's no repentance, Jim. There's no turning back and following the right path. That's the problem. Right. Yeah. And of course, we need holy lay people as well. And uh, as long as the Mass is valid, when we go forward to receive our Lord in the Holy Eucharist, um, we want to be as fully loving him and wide open and in a state of grace and free of as much sin as possible, certainly in a state of grace. Otherwise, it's committing another mortal sin. Um, but to be free of venial sin as well, as much as possible, even though receiving the Holy Eucharist does remit venial sin, uh, we want to we want to receive him with full faith. And that's where we receive the full graces that, uh, that he wants to give us. But we're going to be back. We'll hit the phone lines when we get back as well. Stay tuned. Jim Havens here with Father Jeff Fashion. You can support his good work by going to givesendgo.com slash veritas. That's givesendgo.com slash veritas. Phone lines are open. If you want to sneak a call in here before the end of the show, 1-877-511-5483. Any comment or question you might have, 1-877-511-5483. We'll go to the phone lines now and welcome in Kurt in Boston, Massachusetts. Kurt, how are you doing today? Good, Jim. How are you? How are you, Father? I, I heard a great uh, sermon today on sermons for everyday living, and I think it pertains to what we're talking about. It talks about, you know, how basically Satan tempts us. And then when you think about the Word becoming flesh, and God is the Word, and, and that Word created everything, including the spiritual realm, including the physical realm, it joined it together. And our Lord is a perfect example of it because he obeyed the Father completely, and especially when he said, let not my will be done, but by yours. But in this sermon, I'm trying to dovetail this together, it says the biggest enemy we have is ourselves because the old man is now influenced by Satan. You know, the word became flesh, but Satan's trying to make his evil thoughts corrupt this flesh where we can't accept the bread of angels, God himself, for, for, for these sacraments are basically made for to overcome our defects, to basically fight this spiritual battle against ourselves. And I think in the church, what they've watered down is that battle itself. I was once Protestant. I am a, I've converted many years ago, but I never understood it. Everybody thinks the church is symbolism and the Bible is everything. Well, okay, the Word became flesh. If the Bible can't become flesh, something's got to become flesh. And I, that's why I say when those advisors at Vatican II who are from the Protestant sect came in, they wanted to give us an atmosphere of Protestantism with Catholic sacraments. Well, guess what? Oil and vinegar, I'm sorry, oil and water do not mix. And what happened is we kind of perceive the faith as, well, come as you are. God will accept you anyway and do the best you can. The thing we have to understand is that old man in every one of us and that even every woman has to be fought against. That's why our Lord says, welcome into your father's house, for you have fought the good fight. The good fight is against ourselves. I hope that makes sense. I kind of want your your um, explanation of what I just said. I, I believe it does. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Kurt. Yeah, sin, the flesh, and the devil. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Uh, right, Father, please, uh, thoughts on Kurt's call? 
Yeah, St. Paul is clear that our true enemies are principalities and powers. So there is a war waging against us. There's definitely the reality of spiritual warfare. That's why we do the show. But in a real sense, as he alluded to, we are battling against ourselves and all our even evil inclinations. So if we're honest with ourselves, we have to beg um, our archangel, our guardian angel, to protect us from ourselves because we have all this evil, sin, corruption, um, je jealousy, envy that wells up from the depths of our hearts. And that's what that's what that the caller is referring to is this. There's a war against ourselves, our inclination to evil. St. Paul writes about that. But ultimately, it's Satan, as he really, in a very good way, alluded to that the enemy of human nature is Satan. So we're, we're fighting all this evil, and we're seeing it on so many fronts. When I decided to become a priest, Jim, I was sure that I was going to be persecuted in one form or another, but I always thought it would be from, you know, perhaps the non-believers or the Protestants or those who hate the Catholic faith, but it's actually come from within, and that's the really great evil that we were talking about before this break. So it's absolutely true there's a war going on, okay? Mm -hmm. But I wanted to point out this point in the Catechism toward the end of the section that we have, that we have to remember that all that we have, the Catechism says, to endure comes from God. And please somebody correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was St. Augustine that used to say, the evil exists to exercise us, he used the word. So our spiritual exercises are very much this fight against those who would persecute us and do evil against us. God puts them in our lives to exercise us. Okay, so what does the Catechism say? First, he who thinks himself injured ought to above all, and this is key to Catholic theology and doctrine, above all to be persuaded that the man on whom he desires to be revenged was not the principal cause of the loss or injury. Thus, that admirable man, Job, when violently injured by the Sabaeans, the Chaldeans, and by Satan, took no account of these, but as a righteous and very holy man exclaimed, with no less truth than piety, the Lord gave and the Lord taketh away. The words and the example of that man of patience should therefore convince Christians, and the conviction is most just, that whatever chastisements we endure in this life come from the hand of God. We said that so much on this show. Everything, nothing happens without God willing it. Every chastisement of this life comes from the hand of God, the Father and author of all justice and mercy. He chastises us not as enemies, but in his infinite goodness corrects us as children. To view the matter in its true light, men in these cases are nothing more than the ministers and agents of God. Okay, One man, it is true, may cherish the worst feelings towards another. He may harbor the most malignant hatred against him, but without the permission of God, he can do him no injury. That's why everything comes from the hand of God. Nothing happens without him willing it. Nothing. This is why Joseph was able patiently to endure the wicked counsels of his brethren and David the injuries inflicted on him by Simi. So it's a great reality I think we often forget this whole problem, Jim, of suffering. Why do I have to suffer? Why did God do this to me? Okay, it's for your good and your growth and holiness for your sanctification. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I think it was, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, but it was coming up very strongly in the catechism regarding hating sin and to understand that that is where we are to put our hatred, a hatred of sin. I would say a hatred of the devil as well and all of the demons. Um, but where we don't put that hatred is on other human beings. And um, this is very clear in the catechism here under the fifth commandment, uh, thou shall not kill, where it talks about um, how many sins are linked together with this one sin of hatred, how many evil consequences there are. And it says, not without good reason is hatred called the sin of the devil. The devil was a murderer from the beginning, and hence our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, when the Pharisees sought his life, said that they were begotten of their father, the devil. It goes on to say, to look to the example of the Redeemer, for he in whom even suspicion of fault could not be found when scourged with rods, crowned with thorns, finally nailed to a cross, uttered that most charitable prayer, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so um, very strong here. I've never really 
have 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 seen a teaching this strong on forgiveness as the way that the the Catechism of the Council of Trent lays it out here under the fifth commandment, uh, very worthy of uh, of your attention and to really spend some time pondering and examining your own conscience um, by reading through this. Father, please continue. And as you were speaking, I was thinking of how we alluded to the reality of sin and scandal. And it's one thing to sin and repent, but the problem that we're seeing is this uh, refusal to repent or this persistence and even this um, pushing it off, if you will, on others, even within the church. So I don't think I have to give specific examples. There's plenty there for us to call to our own minds what I mean, but we see it. Okay, in the cancel culture, in the pro LGTB movement and whatnot, Jim. And so there's this constant battle of, as you were saying, loving the sinner, calling him out, fraternally correcting him in a charitable way, but absolutely bringing the sword to sin like Jesus did because he loved sinners. He preferred to be with them more than anybody else, but he never for once, for one instant, endured or put up with their sinful behavior or you know their false doctrine Jim. Hmm. yeah thank you father jeff fashion again support his good work give send slash veritas father can you close us out with a final blessing et benedictio dei omnipotentis patris et fili et spiritus sanctus descendat super et semper amen